I'm Dylan Cronin. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Ohio State. Um, I'm in uh, Virginia Rich and Matt Sullivan's labs. Um, I mostly do computational work where I look at um, metagenomes and uh, I look at microbial ecology and viral ecology um, in the oceans and soils. Um, I, I have provided my email here um, and I think we'll also be providing some additional resources later on. Um, so associated with this talk is a GitHub um, that will go through some of the steps uh, for doing some processing of metagenomes from reads um, down to building the mags themselves. Um, so that will be an additional resource on top of this talk. I provided some commands within the presentation itself, but um, it's not, the commands themselves aren't comprehensive. Um, so I'll be providing that afterwards. Uh, so um, this is the microbiome informatics webinar series. Um, you've heard from Matt uh, for introductions, um, Sharif for uh, high performance computing and um, using 16S uh, to do some ecological inferences uh, with Chime and Mother. And then you've also heard from Ahmed uh, about advanced uh, statistics, um, which was last week's talk uh, where he went over some um, network analysis as well through WGCNA. And so this time um, we're going to go from read uh, QC to building genomes, um, along with some additional steps in there um, to talk about um, doing ecology from metagenomes. And then afterwards, there will be roughly a one month break from this talk. Um, so things will pick back up again in September. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll get started here. Um, so basically uh, we start from environmental DNA and from our environmental DNA, we can then go and build um, metagenome assembled genomes, which are mags. And uh, just for reference, um, you can see mags uh, or bins um, referencing these genomes that are made. Um, essentially, they mean the same thing. Mags typically are thought of as a more final product, a refined product, and the bins are a raw product but um, for the most part, you can look at them as the same term. Um, so we start from our environmental DNA. Uh, we sequence that into short reads. Um, these don't necessarily have to be short reads now. They can be much longer reads with uh, new sequencing tech. Um, so from these reads, we can map to already existing reference databases to uh, look at what kinds of organisms are present in our samples. Uh, alternatively, uh, we can assemble our short reads into longer contiguous segments called contigs. So we're taking each of these reads that are similar to one another um, and grouping them to um, assemble into a longer sequence. And from contigs, uh, we can do a couple of things. Um, so we can take a genes to ecosystems um, approach at analyzing our data. And essentially that means um, we're looking at the genes um, predicted from our contigs to then make inferences about functional potential um, of our samples and of the organisms that are existing within that sample. And then in addition to that, you can also uh, do some viral ecology. So as of now, um, uh, mag recovery, uh, doesn't work as well um, for viral ecology. Um, there are a number of reasons for that, but uh, the major reason is that we can't necessarily assess all that well um, uh, the quality of genomes for viruses in particular, uh, just because we lack uh, some of the sequences that we use um, or like features that we use of microbial genomes um, for viruses. Um, it's just a different sort of analysis. So in that case, we normally work from contigs. And I think you'll be hearing about that later on as well. Um, 
from uh, subsequent talks. And so from contigs, we can then bend these um, into genomes. Um, they're not always fully complete genomes. Um, so we do the best that we can with the information that we have to recover genomes. And we're trying to mimic what was originally in the environment. But ultimately, we do come up short um, in terms of representing every genome well um, within our sample. And so uh, once we have our genomes, we can do a genomes to ecosystems approach. So um, this is a little different from the genes to ecosystems in the sense that uh, we're using uh, the entire organism um, to infer uh, about metabolisms in the environment. And we can look at pathways just within the organism uh, itself to further refine our idea of which organisms are important in our environment, which metabolisms are important in our environment, and who is actually doing them. So in the genes to ecosystems approach, we don't really know who is doing what, but in the genome to ecosystems, we can specifically identify a certain lineage that is completing a certain metabolism. So uh, this is the general processing pipeline. Uh, taking reads all the way to uh, metagenome assembled genomes. Um, so we start with our raw reads. Uh, generally, you run FASTQC, which is like a quality check on your raw reads. You run it through some quality control tools, uh, and then you have your cleaned reads. And again, you run this FASTQC check uh, to make sure that your reads are of the best quality they can be. And then from there, we take those reads and we can assemble them into contigs. Uh, we can use several uh, binning tools um, to create bin sets. And then more recently, um, there are some tools that consolidate multiple binning tools um, so that you can leverage all of that information at once and build a high quality bin set. And um, so this is uh, specific to the GitHub that will be associated with this talk, but um, the data leveraged um, for processing steps in that, um, in that GitHub are from this uh, resource, which is the Critical Assessment of Metagenomic Interpretation, a benchmark of metagenomic software. Um, essentially, this is a paper that uh, tries to look at the performance of current tools um, and compare them against one another. Um, and the, this is a synthetic data set that contained 596 genomes. Um, and it's supposed to contain strain level diversity. And it's across multiple samples. So there are five samples within this set. Um, so it's sort of called a time series, but um, it's synthetic. Um, and then just to point this out as well, and I'll reference this paper a couple of times uh, later on, um, there is a more recent update. Uh, so a paper came out in April, 2022, which assessed many of the tools um, that are used for assembly and binning. Um, and so you can get a decent idea of uh, which tools are performing well and so that can help inform um, what tools you're actually picking in your analysis uh, too. So uh, right now, uh, I'll focus on the initial view and quality control, um, starting from our raw reads. And so uh, read quality control, um, you really just want to uh, make sure you don't have incorrect base calls, um, or um, any errors associated in your read files. Um, you want to remove ambiguous bases. Uh, when you sequence, um, you also have adapters and primers that can um, exist on your sequences. And uh, ultimately, it can ease computational burden uh, on your assemblers to run quality control. I would say that's not always the case unless it's a really harsh quality control so that you're reducing your reads by quite a bit. Um, 
most of the time uh, running it from your R or your Q seed, uh, at least for short reads, um, will normally have like a very similar number of reads at the end. Um, and so uh, we try to remove adapters and primers um, because we don't want that uh, going into our contigs or our genomes later on when we're assembling. Um, and to look at quality, uh, there's a tool called FastQC and MultiQC. So FastQC runs on a single sample, um, while MultiQC is, is like a wrapper that can aggregate multiple FastQC runs. Um, and display them into a nice HTML file. And FastQC also has um, a display into an HTML file as well for each uh, read set. So this is uh, an example of what you might see when you run FastQC. Um, it provides a summary of various uh, statistics and reports, um, and it gives you warnings for certain, um, uh, certain sequence features. Um, one potential uh, caution I would take with this is just that um, this tool wasn't necessarily designed for metagenomes. Um, so if that is your application uh, for FastQC in particular, um, this is still useful and it is worth looking at what these warnings are and if there are issues, um, just take it with a grain of salt that it might not actually fit their desired distribution, for example. So it could throw out a warning when it's actually fine. And so uh, it provides some basic stats um, with the file name and how many sequences. Um, it gives per base quality, and you'll see that in a second. Um, and so I'll go through a couple of these. So this is an example of a per base quality plot where on the x-axis um, you're seeing the position on the read um, and then y-axis it's the quality uh, of that read at a certain position and so uh, generally higher quality is better here um, these are based on fred quality scores uh, so a score of 10 is uh, roughly a 10 percent error rate um, while a score of uh, going upwards from that um, is uh, in order of magnitude higher each time. Uh, so uh, score of 30 and above is around a 99.9% .9 accuracy, uh, which is fairly good. Um, this is probably a worst case sort of scenario. Um, maybe not worst case, but this is a very harsh example uh, where the quality is very rapidly declining. Um, oftentimes it won't uh, look this bad. Um, so this is a, an example of a really good read set um, where the um, decline in quality uh, isn't as strong um, and everything is remaining above uh, roughly a 30 quality score. And generally, um, you could see in that last plot and in this one, um, towards the uh, three prime end, um, quality is tending to decrease. And so uh, something else that is uh, very useful uh, from FastQC is that it looks for adapter content in your sequences. Um, so in this case, it's not really detecting any. Um, so it's giving us this green check mark, but it looks for Illumina, um, Nextera, um, solid uh, potential adapters. Um, and it will throw out a warning if it's seeing them, especially within these first uh, few bases on the left here. And so this is one of, I think, the most important things to check, uh, just to make sure you're removing any adapters because those are not the biological sequences that we actually care about. Uh, there are two tools to uh, actually do the quality control. Um, so what I was showing before were visualizations of the raw reads, um, but then you actually want to run a quality control tool on your read set. Um, there are two, these are two pretty popular tools. In reality, it doesn't really matter what tool you use to um, run your quality control as long as um, the quality at the end of this ends up being fairly decent. 
Um, one tool that I think is fairly convenient is BBDuck. Um, and this is a tool developed by JGI. Uh, it is incredibly fast. Um, it can also incorporate trimming and quality control all within one command. Um, it makes everything easier. It can look for adapters uh, from uh, multiple different sequencing uh, technologies. Um, yeah, it, it's just pretty convenient and easy to use. Uh, so this is an example of an installation and a, an example command. And again, this is would be provided on that GitHub link. Um, so uh, for installation, I used a Conda environment. Um, in general, when you make Conda environments, uh, I would make sure that you label your Conda environment name with the proper version. Um, if you don't uh, and you later want to install newer versions, it just becomes more complicated. Um, you don't know which version is which. Um, so this is just a, a good uh, sort of best practice to follow when you're installing new software. Uh, and so yeah, you create your environment um, that's named bbmap um, dash, this is the version number 38.51. Um, then you activate that environment and then you can install that uh, software through the Conda environment. And Conda or Anaconda, it's it's pretty convenient. Uh, a lot of tools actually provide um, a method to install through Conda, um, and it does everything for you. Uh, so it's, it's really hands-off, and you're only running a couple of commands to install software. So it's extremely convenient. Uh, I suggest it uh, if you can. And then, uh, so this is an example of a QC and trimming step. So this is running BB Duck. Um, another nice thing about uh, some of these BB tools is that you can provide an interleaved file. So what that means is that the forward and reverse reads are all contained within the same file. And then um, you can specify outputs so that it splits them up into forward and reverse alone. Most tools want it in that format and the forward and reverse separately. Um, so you have your paired uh, reads afterwards. And so out one is the forward reads, out two is the reverse reads. Um, we're setting a min length of 51 here. Um, generally, you wanna set this to around a third of what your read length actually is. Um, I would say it's um, somewhat rare for your reads to actually get this short but it is theoretically impossible or theoretically possible. Um, in addition, you want to quality trim um, from both sides. This is uh, assessing a minimum quality, average quality for the whole read, and then also setting uh, sort of windows uh, for looking across the sequence. And then this is what I was mentioning before, where this reference is looking at a FASTA file reference of adapters um, that BBMAP has provided. And so it will look for those adapters within your reads and then remove them out. Um, so this is, this is something that really I haven't seen in many other uh, read quality control tools that I find extremely convenient. And so this is an example output um, where it's giving you sort of numbers on your input reads and bases, um, how many it's remo removing for uh, quality trimming um, and uh, low quality disca discards. So uh, what I mentioned before in setting a quality threshold. And then also uh, how many you're removing and the final result. Uh, so you notice, you can notice here that uh, many of the reads remain. Um, so this is partly a function of this being a synthetic data set. Uh, so the read quality is pretty high in general. Um, however, uh, and on a normal sample, uh, you could see um, around 90%, for example, of your reads uh, being removed. Um, you will still, you still should be, you still should retain most of your reads here. Um, even if it is uh, a real sample on a complex data set. And so uh, 
like I said before, you want to run your fast QC before and after. Um, and so this is an example of looking at it after you ran your quality control. And you can see here that the um, average quality across uh, the read is fairly high here. And yeah, so uh, with fast QC, you can check if the quality has improved. Um, you want to look for uh, average quality drops. Um, sequence duplications, GC content, uh, overrepresented sequences, and adapter content. Um, these are some of the most important factors to take a look at. And so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so now uh, we'll go into assembly and uh, I'll go through some of the theory uh, that goes into assembly and the tools that you can use to actually um, complete your assemblies. So uh, assemblers distinguish noise from biological variation. Um, sequences are not random. Um, so that means there are genes, operons, promoters that exist on your sequence and that structure your sequences. And what this also means is that if we chop up our DNA, we should be able to assemble that DNA back into contiguous sequences that represented that original structure. And so uh, another feature of biological sequences are that uh, they are biased in nucleotide usage. Um, so for example, different uh, lineages can have different biases in nucleotide usage um, and KMER content. And that can also exist even within a genome uh, for certain regions of your genome, whether that's um, a more conserved region or a more variable region. And uh, so for example, um, a 50 MER, so uh, 50, a sequence of 50 nucleotides um, existing twice in a sequence uh, at random uh, is a really low probability, which essentially means that um, when you have sequences of appreciable length, uh, it's very likely that that is a real sequence and not random. And uh, repeated sequences can exist in biological sequences. Um, so they can be low complexity, conserved protein domains, um, and duplicated genes. So there are two major types uh, of assembly algorithms one of which is overlap layout consensus, and the other is a De Bruyne graph. Uh, why are there two of them? Ultimately, that's because of sequencing technology. So overlap layout consensus was actually one of the uh, original algorithms designed to assemble our sequences. And that's because um, in earlier technology, actually the reads were longer. Um, and as the years went by, the longer reads uh, generally were of lesser quality. Um, and then we went into this next gen sequencing where we use shorter reads. And uh, these shorter reads are typically of higher quality, but again, much shorter. So we have to use a different algorithm to assemble them. And so the general idea of overlap layout consensus is that uh, we start with our reads um, that are uh, much longer than what you would imagine for short read sequencing. Um, and we identify the overlaps between our reads. And then from these overlaps, uh, we can build a, a network essentially, uh, where uh, if two reads overlap, then we draw a connection between them. And from this, this graph, we can then use algorithms to walk a path within that graph uh, to build a consensus sequence. And this is what ends up being uh, the contig uh, as a result. Uh, on the other hand, there are De Bruyne graphs. So this is just a pretty simple representation of that uh, where we start with our genome. Um, from this genome, you can have uh, many short reads that uh, separate even further down into KMERS. Um, so to assemble our sequences, we have to build these KMERS out from our short reads. And then from these KMERS, we can build a De Bruyne graph and again, walk a path in that De Bruyne graph to build a contiguous 
assembled sequence. Um, this is a very simplified example um, where there's really only one path here, but uh, it becomes much more complicated. And so uh, something else you can notice here uh, as well is that there are many Cs uh, that exist at the end of the sequence. And um, that is something that assemblers can't always distinguish is um, how long should this be because it all looks the same. Um, so when you cut this uh, contiguous stretch of Cs down into Kmers, it's a bit hard to tell uh, how long this end uh, sequence should be. And so uh, this is an overview uh, of this De Bruyne graph problem again, um, just in a little more detail, where we have in A, we have our sequencing reads. Um, on the left, our, we can have read one. On the right, we have read two. Um, we build our kamers out of that. Uh, so if I didn't mention before again, um, kamers just means uh, that we have a length of sequence. We have a sequence that is of length K. And so if we have a threemer, it's, uh, it has three nucleotides. And so from this Kmer set that we build out of the reads, uh, we then can use the K minus one mer. So we use those Kmers and remove one of those bases to build a graph out of that. Um, so for example, in this Kmer of GCG, the left K minus one mer would be GC, the right K minus one mer would be CG. And then we can draw a connection because we know these two sequences are together. And so from that, we can then build out our graphs for our two reads, and then uh, we can combine them to ultimately build our full graph and assembly. And then we try to, the algorithms uh, try to walk along this graph to assemble our contigs. And so there could be two, um, there are more than two, but these are the major issues that can arise. Um, one of which is um, a bubble within your assembly graph. So uh, this is depicted here where we have our sequences and they're, they are aligned. And then you can see in this fourth position, uh, there are three A's, but in this last sequence, we have a B. So when we actually build out our assembly graph, um, it's going to look like there are two paths that we can take. And so ultimately what the assemblers most likely end up doing is they take the path that has the most coverage. Um, so they take the path with the highest probability essentially and uh, build the sequence from there. Um, however, this could be a real sequence. It could be um, a result from an error that we didn't correct uh, initially. Um, there could be a few reasons why we have this separation. Um, this could be a strain, uh, a different strain that isn't as uh, abundant as another strain. So then we have this split, which also means that we won't capture this variation either uh, because the assembly will take this upper uh, path rather than the lower path. And so it, it's just something to be aware of that um, strain heterogeneity, for example, uh, can be missed um, in certain assembly algorithms. And then uh, another, another issue is when this can happen at the tip uh, of your sequence. Um, and so you generally uh, take a similar approach as I mentioned above. And so this, uh, I thought this was useful to go into because um, we ultimately need to choose our camera set for our assemblies. And so uh, a lot of the tools that you use to assemble your reads um, provide you an option to list the number of cameras that you want uh, the graphs to get split up into. And so something, uh, you need to be aware of is that when you make your cameras small, 
So a uh, very low camera length. Um, the graph ends up being fairly complicated. Um, so there are a lot of connections and a complicated graph means that we don't really know how to walk this graph optimally. But on the other hand, if you make a, or if you decide on a high camera length, um, it means you have a much more simplified graph, which sounds good, but um, it can also mean that uh, you end up reducing the potential size of your contig uh, because your cameras are too long. And so uh, your camera choices can impact your assembly quality. And this is uh, an example of uh, one of the developers of Bandage, which is a tool that can allow you to look at your assembly graphs uh, that came from one of your assembly tools. And um, it visualizes that graph for you. And so what this is, is this assembly used only one camera length, and that was a length of 51. And uh, the one on the right only used a length of 91. And so on the left, you can see that this 51 camera length built this really large, complicated graph um, that ends up being a hairball. Um, and then many other shorter uh, graphs as well. And on the right, when the camera length is longer, um, we don't have this issue. Uh, but we also have many, many sequences that are cut into very short fragments. And so ultimately, there's some balance here. Um, modern assemblers typically use more than one camera length. Um, so you provide it with a range of, uh, I don't know, like seven camera lengths from 20 to 100 or something similar. And uh, it can aggregate all of that information together to build an optimal assembly graph. And so generally, um, the suggestion of uh, the developers of this bandage tool um, is that around 80% of your read length will probably suit most applications well. So when you're deciding on that range of values to set your camera lengths, um, you can probably cap it at around 80% of what your read length is. And so uh, again, uh, De, Bruyne, De Bruyne graphs are used um, in next generation sequencing, although we're now transitioning into long reads. Um, so again, we'll sort of go back to that overlap layout consensus method much more often. Um, but the De Bruyne graphs are good for short read assemblies. Um, there are many different tools that can assemble your data. Um, most of these tools are separated by error resolution techniques. So for example, um, resolving those bubble and tip issues that I mentioned um, and or how the graph is built fundamentally. And uh, there are many tools that can do this. Um, I'm just naming some here, uh, Velvet, CLC, Workbench, um, IDB, AUD. And then some of the more popular, um, at least currently are spades uh, there's a version of this called Metaspades and uh, Megahit. Um, and I would say Spades and Megahit are uh, some of the most common uh, right now. And so um, assembly can be challenging. Um, some microbial genomes are incredibly are large and the samples and sequencing depth that you can have can also be incredibly large. Um, so that means the algorithms have a tough time handling all that data simultaneously or handling a lot of the strain heterogeneity. Um, so uh, oftentimes you think more is better and it is uh, fairly often, but uh, eventually uh, it can be um, an issue. And so, for example, um, spades requires a lot of RAM to be able to run successfully. And so that means you need a lot of compute resources to actually get your assemblies through. Um, and so you ultimately have to decide on certain trade-offs of assembly quality versus speed and ease of um, finishing the assembly itself. So 
certain algorithms take longer with more memory, um, while others um, are more optimized, but uh, for speed and efficiency, but maybe not for the actual quality of the assembly itself. And um, I mentioned that strain heterogeneity is um, one of the more significant challenges. Um, so when you have really, um, when you have very few changes in a sequence, it can be hard to distinguish uh, which path to go down in that um, assembly graph. And so uh, when there is strain heterogeneity and varying abundances of those strains, it can be hard to decide what to assemble. And as I mentioned before, you may not actually be capturing all of that strain heterogeneity from your assembly uh, because the graph may break as a result of that strain heterogeneity um, causing some issues in that alignment. And yeah, so as I mentioned, um, heterogeneity and similarity are ultimately some of the major issues. Um, so for similar sequences or genomes um, or very conserved regions of your genomes, it can be hard to assemble. So for example, the 16S region, um, it is typically not assembled very well at all. Um, and that's because uh, it is so conserved that the very few variations that exist in that sequence um, makes it hard to dis distinguish how to properly assemble that sequence. Um, while on the other hand, um, and that also comes down to strain heterogeneity as well. So, uh, and I, I just explained that, but um, essentially with more strain heterogeneity, um, it means that it's likely we won't actually be capturing that strain heterogeneity in our assemblies, um, but it also makes the assembly graphs harder to resolve, uh, which means that the contigs can break um, or they can just take a particular path while the other strain is largely ignored. Uh, so choosing an assembly an assembler um, can be hard at times. Um, again, memory requirements are a major issue and something to be aware of uh, when you're choosing an assembler. Um, and if the sample is incredibly large, um, you may actually not be able to feed it through uh, any of the common assemblers. So there are some that are less common that are more optimized to run quickly and distributed amongst many processes or nodes. Um, so at that point, you might wanna consider using one of those tools for that sample. Alternatively, um, you can subsample down your larger sample set to um, make it easier to assemble a smaller file. And uh, yeah, some assemblers have a harder time with um, some sample types. Um, so this also comes down to that strain heterogeneity issue or coverage issues. So when there's less coverage uh, for a particular um, sequence, it can make it harder at times to assemble. And some of these algorithms have a easier time dealing with that than others. Um, so from the uh, Kami uh, paper that I mentioned earlier, uh, they also mentioned that, for example, spades can use a roughly 10 times coverage or nine times coverage, um, while mega hit can assemble on 10 times coverage. Um, so different assemblers can handle uh, different levels of coverage uh, better than others. Um, so that's also something worth considering. Uh, strategies for challenging samples. Um, one strategy is read normalization. Um, so BBNorm is a tool, again, from BB Tools that will allow you to normalize your reads um, that can make it easier to assemble. Um, so it's reducing down the number of reads that you have uh, to be able to feed through your assembler. Um, like I mentioned, random subsampling is also an option, um, and that can also be done through BB tools. And um, a third option uh, could be using read classifiers to separate out unneeded lineages. Um, this becomes more complicated, but for example, if you have eukaryotic contamination and you don't care about the eukaryotes in your sample, 
you could read map to a reference, get rid of those reads first, and then assemble afterwards so that it makes it easier on your assembler. And so this is one example, again, uh, just using mega hit. Um, so again, we create our conda environment and we name the version that we're installing. Um, and then it's a fairly simple command where we're taking our forward revert our forward reads um, after dash one, our reverse reads after dash two, and then we output it into a file. And uh, this T is just the number of threads. And so the result of this is a FASTA file. And so this is just looking at the first couple of sequences in your FASTA file. Um, again, so these are our contigs. And a FASTA file is structured in a way where uh, we have our sequence identifier after a caret. And then uh, we have one line. Um, typically, it has some information on there, um, but specifically the sequence identifier. And then we have our sequence. And then again, we have another uh, caret and another sequence identifier and the sequence that follows that. And um, th this is uh, one of the results from uh, that uh, assessment, uh, that Kami paper that I mentioned before that assesses the different tools. Um, and they, looked at some of the assembly metrics for some of these tools and different kinds of data sets. Uh, so the metrics they largely used within this table are strain recall and precision, um, mismatches per 100 uh, kilobases, duplication ratio, misassemblies, genome fraction recovered, and um, basically a sequence length uh, statistic. And uh, interestingly, um, across many of these uh, uh, metrics, uh, HIPMER uh, is a tool that comes out fairly consistently. Um, it is not necessarily the most efficient tool, though. Um, actually, the fastest and most memory efficient mega hit typically comes out of, uh, out of there. Um, they, in this paper, they provide some graphs of um, memory requirements uh, and uh, the amount of time to assemble. Um, in general, uh, we, at least like in the work that I've done recently, um, we sort of debate between mega hit and um, metaspades. Um, in general, mega hit works well for us just because of the um, lower memory requirements and it's a bit faster. Um, however, metaspades, performs better, uh, generally speaking. So it, it's a trade-off you have to consider. Um, if, you're working, uh, if you're working in an environment where you are uh, using resources on a supercomputer, for example, and you're charged for those resources, then you just want to consider that a little more carefully than maybe when you have a local server um, where you aren't competing with many other people to submit jobs then you could submit uh, maybe one of these other tools that takes a bit longer. But in general, um, I haven't actually used Hitmer myself before, but uh, it's something that I'll start to consider because it seems to perform fairly well um, in various types of samples. Uh, so uh, now that we have our contigs, uh, how do we actually obtain abundances from, from our contigs? And so we do that through read mapping. And so again, we start with our um, set of short reads and we have our reference genome, or in this case, our reference um, is the contig or set of contigs that we have built. Um, we take our reads and map them against this reference genome. And mapping just means that we're essentially aligning our set of reads against this contig. And so there are two things that you wanna be aware of. Um, there's uh, horizontal coverage and vertical coverage. Um, so horizontal coverage is essentially how much of this contig um, have you covered horizontally? So is it 95% of the contig that you have covered, 10%, um, um, et cetera? And then vertical coverage is uh, how many reads mapped um, vertically in this position? 
And so, for example, if we looked at like one small region over here, um, you could see that uh, in one of these positions, we would have a vertical coverage of 3x. Um, and generally, to determine actual abundances, you normalize against the length of your sequence um, as well, so that uh, it is a more comparable estimate. And uh, there are several tools um, to do this read mapping. Um, Bowtie 2 uh, and BWA are fairly common and have been around for a while. Um, Minimap 2 is one of the newer uh, read mapping algorithms. Um, it is fairly fast. It is much faster than BWA and Bowtie 2, in my experience. Um, and then there are also some tools that uh, work as a wrapper around some of these standalone tools. So CoverM is one in particular that I would recommend. Um, it essentially, you can give it uh, your reads um, and your reference sequences, and then it can do the mapping and the post-processing for you. So at the end of um, its run, it will give you uh, it will give you abundance information for your contigs or your genomes um, or whatever you fed it. Um, and so it, it's a fairly convenient wrapper for running some of these other read mappers. And read to ref mapper um, is something commonly used in the Sullivan lab here, uh, but it also does some calculations for you on um, your abundances of contigs. And so ultimately what you end up with when you run your read mapping tools are BAM and or SAM files. Uh, SAM files are sequence alignment map files. So it tells you uh, where your reads are aligning to um, and on what positions. And then your BAM file is essentially a compressed version of the SAM file. Um, these files are fairly large as well. So that's something to be aware of. And then ultimately you end up with um, uh, you can end up with percentage identity estimates, um, coverage estimates, uh, whether that's vertical or horizontal. Um, and then from there, you can determine abundances. And uh, so we've gone from uh, our short reads to assembly uh, to build our contigs. And then from these contigs, uh, like I mentioned before, we can take a genes to ecosystems approach. Or for example, we can use these contigs um, for viral ecology. Uh, so to go into um, the sort of genes to ecosystems approach a little more. Um, so we have our contigs that we have just built through assembly. And then essentially we can look for open reading frames or the genes or proteins that exist within our sequences identify those and um, then annotate them for functional potential. And so we can use that functional potential to better understand what the microbes are doing or could be doing. And there are many tools to do this. Um, I provided a couple links for um, theory and finding these open reading frames. Um, there are yeah, several tools here. Um, Prodigal is the most common for uh, microbial work um, and really viral work. Um, however, uh, GeneMark, for example, uh, you can actually train it on uh, certain uh, organisms. And so you can have a more optimal um, gene prediction that can come out. Um, and then there are some other tools like MetaUK, uh, which is fairly new. Uh, which is uh, supposed to be geared towards eukaryotes. Um, and then this is actually an interesting case. Um, PLAS is a, this stands for protein level assembler. Um, so essentially you're taking your reads, um, instantly translating them into proteins more or less, and then assembling those proteins. Um, it's an interesting concept, but uh, something you could do as well uh, with your data. So uh, how do we actually go about looking at um, this sort of genes to ecosystems approach? Um, so we start with our genomes or our contigs. Um, we take 
the predicted genes um, from our genomes. And we have a FASTA file that contains all of these genes together. Uh, we build a database of all of these genes, and then we do an all versus all search of our genes against each other. So then we can determine um, basically some percentage identity that exists between, for example, gene 1A and itself. So that would be 100%. And then gene 1A and gene 1B, and in this case, it's 0%. But we can do this for all of our genes. Um, and so this is uh, sort of a illustrated example of what a BLAST output could yield. And so we take uh, these results and we can build a network representation of those hits. And so uh, what we're building here are um, groups of genes that are highly similar. So for example, when we have gene 1A down here, um, and its relationship to gene 2A is uh, fairly high. So it's a 97% identity. So we draw a connection uh, between these two genes and we can do that for all genes. And then from there, we can cluster our data um, together so that uh, this ends up being like a unit um, for which you can examine your data. So these are all considered when they cluster together, they're considered a gene cluster and they should have roughly a similar function. It's not always the case and it's not always consistent, but uh, it's sort of a rough estimate to cluster our data and reduce the complexity. And so from these um, gene and protein clusters, uh, we can uh, actually do some ecology with it. Um, this is an example from uh, the, OMRGC uh, version two, which is the Ocean Microbial Reference Gene Catalog. Um, and this came from the Tara Oceans Expedition, where uh, on the x-axis here, for example, we have um, prokaryote enriched samples. Um, and then on the y-axis, this is the number of genes detected. As we uh, go along here, um, we're seeing many nonpolar genes. And then suddenly in the polar regions, um, we're discovering a new set of genes uh, that we weren't finding uh, typically elsewhere. And then from these uh, predicted genes, uh, we can also hopefully identify some sort of level of taxonomy. Um, so this is a very broad high level. Um, and then uh, we can also um, determine abundances of these genes within our samples. And so uh, for example, they looked at um, relationships between these genes and various environmental parameters and the correlations between them. Um, so then you can infer some functional link uh, between the functional potential of your uh, organisms and uh, the environment. And uh, something else to be aware of is that marker genes are another mechanism for this gene-based ecology in some ways. Um, and one important concept for uh, using marker genes in gene-based ecology are HMM profiles. So these are hidden Markov models um, and they can be used for sensitive sequence searches. Um, so essentially what this does is uh, you take your sequences uh, of uh, a particular uh, protein or gene and you align them, um, you can then look across these positions for frequencies of uh, certain nucleotides or bases or uh, whatever sequence you're using. And then you can also model insertions that exist and deletions. Um, so uh, this model will allow you to uh, basically build a probability um, that a certain uh, nucleotide exists at a certain position or amino acid, again, whatever you're using. Um, and so it allows for a probabilistic alignment um, across this region of this particular um, protein. And so it allows for some sensitive sequence searches because there is this probabilistic aspect um, associated. Um, and then 
this ultimately allows for you to uh, create these profiles, which you can then search um, other data sets with. Uh, so for example, um, you may be interested in methanogenesis um, and one marker for methanogenesis is MCRA. And so I will take the MCRA sequences um, from, uh, from a database, um, align them, build a HMM profile, and then search it against my samples to see how abundant this gene is. Um, and so uh, this is a typical workflow for marker gene analysis, where we take our uh, we take reference sequences um, and build an alignment, construct the HMM, and then from these alignments um, we can also build a tree. And then we can basically take our metagenomic samples, search against uh, that HMM profile to then uh, find uh, our sequence of interest. And then we can also place this on the tree um, to uh, determine maybe taxonomy or particular clades that we're interested in, um, et cetera. And this figure comes from a tool called GraphTM. Um, and this, this tool can help you build some of these uh, marker gene um, uh, profiles. And uh, something uh, related to this as well is that um, diversity metrics are more robust using single copy genes. Um, so when we want to look at the diversity of microbes within a sample, um, we can use the single copy genes that exist within genomes because they should only exist once, and therefore it should be a more robust estimate of the diversity or richness within our samples. Um, and so this is uh, an example, um, a paper in uh, Bisco, Sweden, that looked at um, the, the mags that existed in the environment, um, in this wetland environment. And they also assessed diversity. And so they used um, this tool called Singalum which looks for the single copy marker genes um, in your data. And from these single copy marker genes, we can then determine um, the diversity of our samples um, in a much more robust way uh, than using our genomes. Because for example, our genomes are much more um, variable. We're not necessarily going to extract all of the genomes in our environment, unfortunately. Um, that would be ideal, but that's just not the case. And so uh, when we used more of these uh, read-based approaches, um, it is more uh, closely going to uh, look at the actual diversity within the sample, um, or more accurately going to determine the diversity in that sample. And um, the way that SingleM works, it actually can use your read sets to look for these single copy genes. Um, and then uh, we can determine diversity from that. And I'll uh, talk about single M uh, a little later as well. Okay, so uh, after that aside, um, so how do we uh, ultimately build um, our mags or population genomes? And so I, I mentioned population genomes here because um, our mags are not necessarily strand level genomes. Um, they, can be a representation of multiple strains. Um, and uh, this is ultimately uh, sort of affected by the assembly issues that I mentioned before with some strain heterogeneity, um, but it's also because we are uh, trying to combine contigs from many different assemblies into, uh, into our genomes. And so, um, So uh, from our contigs, uh, we can build viral populations again, um, but from our mags, uh, we can build microbial populations. And so uh, how do we ultimately end up doing this binning process? Um, and there are really two main methods um, for taking our contigs and building genomes, and that is through sequence composition and differential coverage. Um, so I'll go through uh, what both of these are. Um, 
And so uh, determining differential coverage essentially means looking at the abundance of contigs across multiple samples. So what's represented here are various contigs that belong in certain genomes. Um, across our samples, we look at the abundances of these contigs. Um, and so, for example, um, A here, um, the contig A has a coverage of 1x in sample 1, but it has a coverage of 5x in sample 2, et cetera. And so we can use this abundance information to then build a matrix of our samples versus our contigs. And then ultimately we can use, um, for example, principal component analysis to then cluster um, our abundances uh, to group these sequences together into genomes. And so the assumption is here that contigs that are coming from the same organism will vary in abundance very similarly across samples. And um, so the other piece of this is uh, uh, determining uh, sequence composition. And so um, typically this is done through tetranucleotide frequency, um, but in this example, uh, we're just going to use a camer of two. And so uh, each of these uh, represents one of those camers that were um, generated from our sequence above. And then we can just go across um, all of our camers here on the sequence and fill in our table um, for this particular contig and determine the abundance of our camers within this contig. And so uh, we can do that across uh, many different contigs. Um, so this is what we're doing here, filling out this table of our camera composition for each of our individual contigs. And then again, we can build a, um, or do a principal component analysis from this data and then cluster um, these sequences together. And so that's uh, basically the idea behind it. Um, again, we're using sequence composition or tetranucleotide frequency, which is a camer of four. Um, and differential coverage, or in other words, um, differential abundances across samples. And so, like I've mentioned, um, we tried to build as complete genomes as possible, but there will be gaps, which are represented here, um, or, and or um, there can be con contamination. Um, so we can have contigs that were not uh, grouped properly, and so that ends up being a source of contamination. And in practice, um, how do we actually um, obtain these differential coverage estimates? Um, so this is an example where we have sample one here, we have our uh, contigs represented as lines. And then from our five samples, uh, we map the reads from each of these samples to our set of contigs from sample one. And then we will have five BAM files for sample one um, to then feed into our, our binning algorithm. And so four or five samples, which is what um, I used in the GitHub uh, that will be provided, um, you will end up with uh, 25 total BAM files uh, to determine differential coverage for each of your samples. And uh, this is, uh, Again, an example of how to do this with CoverM. Um, so here again, we're installing CoverM through Conda, and then uh, we're running the read mapping. So uh, CoverM contig, so this is doing the mapping to our contigs. Um, our reference is um, the result of our mega hit assembly earlier. We're using 20 threads. We're uh, putting our BAM files in a particular folder. And then um, this last command is just coupling our reads. So uh, it's just ordering our reads so that um, our, forward, our forward read is separated by a space and then our reverse read. Um, and we do that for all um, five of our samples here. And um, 
from the result of mapping from CoverM, uh, we can then run a few tools. Um, so for example, uh, here we've run Metabat2, Maxbin, and Concoct. Um, you use your set of contigs as input, um, and then you also use the abundance information. Um, so that's what is represented here in this tab separated format. Um, and then this will group your contigs together. Um, so it will determine the, um, the sequence composition clustering and the abundance uh, clustering um, and output a file of uh, genomes for you. And uh, one thing to note too, is that um, generally a, a good threshold for minimum contig length um, that we will use in our genomes um, is around 2,500. And that's because um, at around the sequence length, we can more reliably determine um, our uh, sequence composition estimates. Um, so we have enough data to determine those Kamer frequencies um, to be able to separate out things properly. And so we can use the genomes that were just built from our last step um, and feed them into an ensemble binner. And so an ensemble binner uh, combines the result of multiple tools or multiple binning tools into one aggregated set. Um, so essentially uh, in step one here, we have all of our bin sets. We then look for single copy genes across our contigs within these bin sets. We can then um, aggregate these bin sets, um, leveraging the single copy genes. And then we can rescore um, some of these bins um, so that they are aggregated or split apart. Um, and then we end up with a higher quality um, bin set. I would say the one piece of caution here is that uh, you can end up with higher contamination because you're moving contigs around between bins. However, um, in general, you end up with uh, more, a more complete genome. Um, and so what I'm showing here, this is from a tool called DAS tool, uh, which is one of these ensemble binners. And uh, there's another ensemble uh, binner uh, that's called MetaRap bin refinement. And so this is one of the functions within MetaRap itself, uh, which is a tool that can do a lot of things. Um, but essentially it's doing a very similar process where we take the binning result from three tools. Uh, this algorithm only functions using three tools. Um, we then can compare the bin sets between A and B, uh, B, C, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we estimate completion and contamination from these hybrid bin sets to uh, feed in again, um, to determine the stats of the bins that came from all of our bin sets and pick the best bin. Um, I'll talk about uh, completion and contamination estimates in a little bit, um, but this is an example of running that command where again, um, we're running MetaRat bin refinement. Um, we're using MetaBat2 results, MaxBin2 results, and Concoct results, um, and then uh, giving it 20 threads and uh, outputting that into a file. And so here I've just listed um, some, some binning tools. Uh, there are many others. Um, so Metabat, Metabat2, Concoct, uh, Maxbin, Binsanity, uh, GroupM, and then uh, one that's gained interest uh, of many groups recently is VAM. Um, and then we feed uh, the results from these standalone or initial binning tools into one of our ensemble binning tools. So um, DAS tool, MetaRap, and then uh, UniteM is also an option. So uh, after we obtain all of our genomes from all of our samples, uh, we then want to cluster these genomes into uh, population representatives or species level representatives. Um, so uh, what you're seeing here um, is a depiction of doing this where we have two different strains um, that we're recovering from our samples. 
Um, we have done binning on uh, several different samples here, so five different samples. And we've recovered a genome from sample one um, that represented strain A fairly well. Um, from sample two, uh, it, it had some of strain A and strain B together. Um, three, they had a very similar abundance, so it's sort of a mixed um, population genome here, um, and so on. And so we want to dereplicate this set of uh, genomes into a best representative set. Um, and so we're taking those that are least contaminated and most complete um, and using those as our representatives for further analysis, um, like annotation, for example, which will be talked about in the next, uh, the next talk. So how do you actually do this dereplication process? Um, you can use DREP, uh, which is where this figure came from above. Um, GALA is another option. Um, it is faster than DREP, so it will take much less time um, and provide fairly similar results. Um, and then cluster genomes is typically used for viruses, um, but it could be applied here as well. Um, and when you're clustering uh, viral contigs, um, typically uh, we use around a 95% uh, nucleotide identity threshold um, and 80 to 85% uh, coverage of the smaller genome. And in bacteria and archaea, um, there are, there's literature to support 95% identity being around the species level um, threshold on average across many genomes. Um, so that's a decent threshold to use to cluster uh, or dereplicate your genomes. And one other uh, point I'd like to make quickly is that um, instead of processing all of your samples independently, you can pool all of your read sets together and then co-assemble. Um, the only potential issue with that is when you do this co-assembly and your subsequent binning, um, you can then uh, end up with much more mixing of uh, various strains um, and more contamination. Um, so this is a possible result, um, but co-assembly can be a way to um, extract genomes that you weren't able to on a sample by sample basis. But when you combine samples, um, you want them to be a very similar um, type. Uh, so you don't wanna be combining samples from um, very different environments, for example. Um, so just some tips for maximizing mag recovery, um, assuming that you are not limited by compute resources, which is an assumption. Um, so for number one, uh, use more than one assembly tool. Basically every step that I've described in this process um, can impact the genomes that you're recovering out of your samples. So your read quality control, um, which influences your assembly, and that assembly influences the mags that you recover. Um, and so some, like I said before, some assembly tools can deal with varying coverages or abundances and strain heterogeneity better than others. So if you can use leverage more than one tool to assemble your data, it will help you out. Um, another potential tip is to subsample your original read sets before assembly. So the, the logic behind this is that uh, when you have a very complex sample, you can subsample your reads down into, uh, let's say, 50%, for example. And then when you're subsampling down, you're also removing some of that strain heterogeneity. So you can actually build out your, uh, your assembly graph further uh, than you would have if you had that strain heterogeneity. Um, so it enables you to build some contigs that are longer, um, even though you're reducing your data set down. Um, uh, you can also read map against your recovered mags and then reassemble those remaining reads um, that do not map to the genomes. Um, so again, uh, reducing the complexity of your data set in general will um, at times improve uh, the potential assembly. So then you could uh, also recover genomes that you were not able to assemble well previously. And then uh, just leveraging as many standalone binning tools as possible, um, and you can feed them into uh, one of these ensemble binners. 
And uh, again, this is um, one of the tables uh, from that Kami paper that I mentioned before. Um, and they assessed binning performance as well uh, based on uh, average completion or average completeness, uh, purity of the bins, um, and some other metrics here. And um, you can just see that, uh, for example, Concoct performed fairly well. Um, Ultra Binner and MetaWrap um, are not. So again, uh, Ultra Binner is using DAS tool, which is uh, an ensemble binner. MetaWrap is as well. So it's a little bit of a different comparison there. Um, but you can see here too, um, some of the fastest and most memory efficient tools um, are Metabat2, um, VAM, and MaxBin. So uh, oftentimes, at least in, in my hands, um, I've seen Metabat2 perform fairly well um, in our uh, soil samples. So it is a go-to uh, for me personally, um, especially if I'm concerned about uh, resource usage. Uh, and so now that we have our genomes, um, I just want to go into quality control of these genome bins um, to sort of close, close out this talk. So uh, there's a paper um, that uh, is titled Accurate and Complete Genomes from Metagenomes. Um, and they go through a workflow that allows you to take your genomes and um, try to build a more high quality set I will caveat this by saying, um, if you follow the procedure in this paper, um, I would only do this in the cases where you have a um, very specific interest in an organism and you really want to uh, maximize um, your understanding of it and uh, complete the genome. Um, however, this is a very uh, labor intensive process um, so doing this on thousands of genomes just really isn't feasible. Um, but before I get into that uh, workflow, um, I just want to go into uh, contamination and completeness estimates and how we determine that for microbial genomes. And so for both of these stats, um, we're looking at uh, unique single copy genes. And so for completeness, um, the number of unique single copy genes present within a bin is divided by the number of unique single copy genes that should be present in the genome for that lineage. So there's a tool called CheckM um, that can produce these results. And it, it does so in a lineage specific manner. So different lineages can have different single copy genes that are present within their genome. And so, uh, it's sort of optimized in that way that it'll look um, specifically for a certain lineage. Uh, and that's completeness. So um, if you have 95% uh, of your single copy genes present, um, then you are roughly uh, at a completeness of 95%. Um, on the other hand, contamination is how many single copy genes are present in multiple copies. So again, these are single copy genes. They shouldn't be present more than once. And if they are, that means that you have uh, contamination. And uh, so generally, um, uh, in the work that I've done, um, and uh, there are other references for this as well, um, we use a cutoff of roughly 70% completeness um, as a minimum, and then as a maximum for contamination at around 10%. Um, there are uh, standards for this and determining quality of your genomes through uh, MyMag standards, which um, was a sort of protocol developed through JGI. Um, and there are several tools that can give you that information, but 70% um, completion and less than 10% contamination is a pretty good place to start. Um, so single copy genes don't always account for all of the contamination uh, within a genome. And so what's represented here um, is one particular genome where on these, uh, uh, I don't even know how to describe that, these arches, uh, we have GC content um, in this first arch. And in the subsequent ones, um, 
this is the abundance of this genome within particular samples. And so again, this is sort of getting at the sequence composition and the abundance across samples, uh, which is what you use to form your bins. And so what this tool uh, called Anbio does is it can allow you to visualize this information and it will also cluster that data. Um, so it will provide you a visualization and you can select uh, regions of these genomes uh, so that you can sort of separate it out if there is potential contamination. And so what you can see here um, is that on this left-hand side, there is um, an inconsistency in terms of um, coverage information, um, as well as uh, roughly lower um, GC content here or different GC content. And so um, this looks like uh, potential contamination within this genome. And so originally um, they assessed the completeness um, of this genome um, and contamination. And this region of contamination wouldn't actually contribute uh, to the estimate because there are no single copy genes within this small region. And so what that means is essentially that you can have um, you can have contamination beyond what the single copy genes can represent. Um, and so you just have to be aware of that. And this also argues for um, using some downstream tools to uh, further refine your bin set um, into a more quality set. And there are some automated options for that as well. Um, another caveat um, is that CheckM cannot identify contamination well in very incomplete genomes. Um, so this is an example where uh, there were single cell amplified genomes that were not very complete. And so if you don't have very many single copy genes uh, to work with uh, from the start, um, it's hard to actually assess how much contamination you have in general. Um, so they knew uh, how much contamination was in these genomes because uh, they already knew what, uh, like where contigs belonged prior uh, because these were single cell amplified. And so uh, CheckM estimated the contamination to be fairly low in these genomes. Um, however, the actual contamination was much higher. And again, this comes down to uh, you need a fairly complete genome to rely on these estimations well, but um, generally like 50% or higher is um, uh, a good place to start. Um, and uh, like I mentioned before, um, we generally use 70% complete and less than 10% contaminated. And when you're doing that, it should account for this problem where you won't have this much of a difference between actual and estimated contamination, and it will be much more similar to the estimated. And um, there's uh, another tool that can also help detect uh, mag uh, chimerism and contamination. And this tool is called Gunk. Um, this is a fairly uh, recently developed tool. Um, something I didn't mention before is that you could have contamination from more than just the, the binning procedure and assembly. Uh, it can also just come from um, laboratory or kit contamination. Um, culture media contamination, if it's an isolate. And then it, it is also possible that um, in the process of sequencing, you have index hopping. So um, some reads end up in your samples that didn't actually belong there. Um, so these are all potential sources and you want to account for them. Um, and uh, so in panel B here, um, we have some of these uh, potential cases of contamination um, where the top left, there isn't any, um, the bottom left, there is non-redundant contamination. And then uh, we have both types uh, in this right-hand column. And so what uh, Gunk aims to do uh, is that it's not specifically looking at the single copy genes. Um, it's actually looking at um, the breadth of genes that exist within the genome. And it's trying to leverage the taxonomic information 
um, or classifications of those genes um, and against its reference database. And so if there is consistency within uh, these taxonomic predictions, it is less likely that uh, this, this potential genome or bin is, uh, is contaminated. And so it'll uh, essentially spit out a score um, for you uh, where they have designed a threshold as to whether or not something is um, contaminated or not. And if it is, you just want to look in further into that genome. And uh, another option for a tool is Refine M. Um, this does automated bin quality control. Um, so basically it's looking for outliers in terms of, again, sequence composition or differential abundances. Um, and then it's looking to remove those uh, regions or contigs uh, that seem to not belong. Um, and it can do that in an automated fashion. So you're essentially feeding it uh, your uh, contigs um, and then the bins that you have made. Um, and in this case, it's through MetaRep. Um, and the BAM files. Uh, so it will have your abundance information. Um, it can determine outliers uh, based on these stats it determined previously. And then it can remove those outliers. Um, and uh, I've done some um, hand curation of genomes. I've done it in an automated way. Um, this does a pretty good job of uh, removing potential contaminants. And another option for bin QC is mag purify. This is another tool that does a very um, similar task as Refinum does previously, but uh, maybe you prefer this tool. So I, I just uh, also linked it here in case you're interested. So uh, this is the suggesting binning um, slash QC pipeline for complete mags that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, you really only want to go down this, uh, this path if you have a very particular interest in a certain organism and you really want to uh, complete that genome as best as you can. And so here, step one, um, you reconstruct uh, genome bins from assembled scaffolds like we've been talking about uh, throughout this talk. Um, and you can use a variety of tools. I've named some that they did not uh, label here, just um, so that you are aware. Um, we can compute estimates of genome bin completeness, like I said. Um, Anvio is another uh, interactive tool. Um, I mentioned it uh, previously with that visualization of the genome. Um, but in general, CheckM is uh, sort of the standard for determining completeness and contamination. Uh, KBase also provides some tools to do so. And um, one thing that you can do um, to improve uh, bin completeness, which I think I mentioned in the uh, tips for maximizing um, mag recovery, uh, this is another option where you can map reads back to your genome bin and then reassemble that genome bin. So again, uh, you're reducing all the noise from all the other reads uh, from other organisms, and then you're just reassembling only your genome bin, um, and hopefully you can obtain longer contigs uh, by doing that. And then uh, in step three, you can check for and remove contamination in your genome bin. Um, so we discussed some automated methods. Um, RefineM and MagPurify are two automated methods. Um, Gunk is also automated, but um, it's more of a contamination estimate. Um, and again, CheckM is an option here. Um, and then Anvio, um, it is a great tool for visualizing your genomes and clustering your data in a way that you can easily manage it. Um, so I, I do suggest using that tool. Um, in step four here, we check the number of scaffolds in a genome bin. It says ideally the number of contigs is less than or equal to four. This probably is a very rare case. Um, and even in the paper that uh, this sort of um, workflow was used, um, they actually did not have the number of contigs as less than four or even less than 10. Um, so these are just sort of suggested guidelines um, for continuing forward down this path. 
Um, and then uh, ultimately uh, we go down to step five, which is scaffold extension and overlap based assembly. So if you remember before, uh, I mentioned uh, overlap uh, layout consensus assembly, and you can actually uh, use that uh, algorithm on your, on your contigs in your bins to then uh, try to assemble a long contiguous sequence. And then in addition to that, um, we can do some scaffold extension. Uh, so there's some tutorials provided for this um, on GGK base, um, and they go through the process of um, extending out your scaffolds and closing gaps. Um, but essentially this comes down to um, taking your contigs um, for a particular genome and then mapping your reads to the ends of these contigs. So then you can build out uh, consensus sequences from your reads to then further extend out your contig so that hopefully you are closing gaps um, that exist within your genome. Um, and uh, at the end of this process, we can then uh, look for uh, GC skew, which is um, another potential way to look for contamination. Um, so, GC skew can give some idea of genome quality. Uh, so within your genome, um, there is a very, at least for prokaryotes, uh, there's typically a very defined uh, GC skew at the origin, um, which also takes place at the termination uh, because, yeah, well, yeah, obviously. Um, so uh, the termination is represented in blue and then origin is in red. And so uh, in cases where there's contamination or um, the contigs are not oriented properly, um, you can end up with uh, GC skews that uh, don't appear to uh, follow the pattern that is expected, uh, which is a shift at the termination uh, slash origin site. Um, so we can reorient our contigs or remove potential contaminating contigs to then uh, build out a more optimal uh, GC skew for our genome. And uh, one, one thing I want to mention quickly is that um, we can also use single M uh, to have an idea of what lineages you are missing. So um, this is an example um, that they have provided on their GitHub page, um, but you can run single M on your reads and it'll generate a um, table for you. And then you can also run it on your genomes. And so again, what single M is doing, it's looking for single copy genes. Um, and so it can look at what's in your reads, identify roughly what the um, taxonomy of those reads are, and then it can compare that to what you're actually recovering in your uh, genomes. So you use single M appraise to sort of compare these results. And then you end up with something like this, where um, you're, uh, what's shown here are um, different reads at the bottom that uh, have uh, various taxonomies associated. Um, so you can see that here with the various colors. Uh, and then it compares what's in your reads to what's in your genomes. So for example, in the bin set, we're recovering uh, some of these uh, taxonomic uh, uh, or some of these lineages that are listed here, but we're also missing some. So these two are unbinned. Uh, and for example, maybe you have a very um, specific interest in organisms that you're not actually recovering from your samples. So uh, you may want to use this tool so, to um, quantify that problem. Um, it can also give you an idea of which samples you could potentially um, sort of co-assemble to then try to specifically target these organisms since you want a genome um, for uh, their representative. Um, so I, I think this tool just provides a very, um, it, it's something I haven't seen elsewhere where it's uh, estimating what you are missing from your genome set. 
Uh, and I think that's useful information for understanding the context of your data um, in terms of what percentage of genomes um, that I have recovered are actually uh, in our samples. Um, but it can also help you target lineages that you specifically want as well. And um, this is, uh, I think, the last slide uh, where I just wanted to mention that it's also possible to recover um, eukaryotic genomes. Um, essentially, you can run uh, the same binning procedures that we mentioned previously. Um, there are many caveats uh, with doing that and that you can get more contamination um, if you're interested in some of these eukaryotes. Um, and uh, there are some workflows to uh, pull out eukaryotic genomes. Um, I have linked here uh, one particular workflow, which is called eukrep. Um, what you are doing in this pipeline is um, running eukrep, which uh, identifies whether or not a contig is a eukaryote or a uh, prokaryote. It splits those up. And then you can run your typical binning tools on your, um, your eukaryotic uh, contigs. And so uh, that's what Concoct or Metabat would do. Um, you can do some gene prediction uh, using various tools. Um, and then uh, Busco is a way to uh, estimate completeness and contamination within eukaryotic genomes. Um, so caveats are that uh, your library prep and sequencing or, and extraction could all influence what you are seeing uh, from the eukaryotic side. Um, and that's not well quantified to this point. Um, and then secondly, um, you won't always be able to recover eukaryotic genomes, even if you expect to. Again, it can be a part of uh, what I just mentioned, but. Um, the eukaryotic genomes are also like much more complex. Um, so the gene prediction is tougher to do um, than in prokaryotes. Um, so you just have to be aware of the caveats, but uh, there are some cases of using uh, these binning tools for uh, generating eukaryotic genomes. And uh, that's pretty much where I'm going to end it. Um, next time, uh, which is about a month from now, uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Kayla Borton and Rory Flynn on uh, DRAM. And so what DRAM is, it can annotate your genomes and look for, again, that functional potential um, for your genomes. And it has a bunch of nice visualizations and summary, and it's a really nice software for annotating um, your sequences. Uh, okay, so. That's all I have. Um, let's see if I can look for questions now. Um, okay. Uh, do you recommend combining all contigs from all three binners and running CD hit EST to dereplicate? Um, yeah, so that is an option. Um, so for those that don't know, CD hit EST is um, it's a way to dereplicate your sequences by percentage identity. So it's just a quick algorithm that can um, identify percentage identity uh, estimates between two sequences. Um, so if you have like a high percentage identity, then you can uh, dereplicate them. Um, and yeah, I I would if you use multiple. Wait, so. If you use multiple assemblies, I would dereplicate. Um, if you are running multiple binners, I would just use one of the ensemble approaches uh, because it will inherently uh, dereplicate your genomes for you. Um, so um, if you're running multiple assemblies again, uh, you, you should dereplicate. But if you're running multiple binners, I would recommend just using one of the um, ensemble binners or just dereplicating your genomes from there. There's no need to uh, uh, dereplicate those bins using CD hit EST. It's just not really designed for that. Um, okay, I think I did that one. Okay. Uh, 
My metagenomic reads have a lot of noise in the per base sequence content for the first 16 base pairs. I have heard this is normal for Nextera and Illumina sequencing. Will this noise affect assembly? Um, so it, it's possible um, that it will affect assembly. Um, a potential option could be to uh, like trim the ends if you are having a lot of noise um, in many of your reads. Um, however, uh, it's probably fine. Uh, so read QC can affect your assembly um, and your genome recovery, but uh, to what extent, it sort of depends on how many reads actually are like showing this noise. Um, so something you could try is just to trim the ends um, or um, you were, as long as the quality seems good, um, you could just go ahead and assemble. Um, the, the, assemble the assembly itself, um, some people may disagree with me on this, but uh, it, it does in some ways, um, it can correct for some of the errors um, again, because of those um, consensus methods where uh, you need to have certain coverages to go along certain paths in that assembly graph, but it could also result in uh, misassemblies too. So um, that's just a trade-off. But um, yeah, I would say an option is to trim off the end of the reads, um, but it's probably okay. Um, is there generally a decline in quality of reads as you go along the reads? Yes. There is. Um, how does FastQC know which base calls are incorrect? Um, it, it doesn't know what is incorrect, um, but it knows the quality information for a particular um, base pair on the read. So when you um, get your uh, FastQ files, those FastQ files contain information about the quality at each particular position. Um, so it will give you some idea of whether or not it's error prone um, uh, or like of lower quality. Um, so if there's a higher error potential for that particular base. And so it's just reading that information and then uh, summarizing it and spitting it back to you or FastQC is doing that um, in an HTML format. And so it's just like letting you see all of that information in a graph rather than you trying to translate the FASTQ file. Um, if we do care about SNPs within a sample, is there an assembly algorithm that is best for this application or should we stick to read-based tools? Um, so if you care about uh, SNP profiles, um, So first I would say you want to do a fairly hard QC on your reads, even more so than you would feed into an assembly typically. Um, second, uh, you can still assemble um, because if you're looking for SNPs um, after the fact, uh, you will be doing mapping to your references and looking for those um, single nucleotide changes. And that will show up in your read mapping. Um, so if the assembler chose a particular um, base based on the assembly graph, um, you will be able to see that um, some uh, that there are SNPs at that position, right? Um, so it, it's you you definitely can still assemble um, and uh, look for those SNPs afterwards. Um, if there's an assembly algorithm that is best for this application. Um, So there are some that recover uh, strain level um, sort of variations better than others. Um, ultimately, I would, it, it's hard to say um, if there is one that is better, um, but I, I, I would just, uh, I would say again, you probably can use any of those assembly algorithms and just map against those references. Um, and the results should be fairly consistent across um, assembly types. But um, 
like I said, you could take a look at that paper um, that I mentioned, um, and they did try to sort of estimate um, if there are some binning or uh, some uh, assembly tools that were performing better at recovering strains, and so you may be interested specifically in that application. So maybe I would choose um, an assembler because of that. Um, is strain heterogeneity a good or bad thing? Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it, it depends on what you mean by that. Um, in the environment, it's, uh, well, so I, I'll just go from the context of assembly. Um, strain heterogeneity can cause breaks in your assembly graph. Um, however, it is true biological variation, um, so you care about it. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily say good or bad thing, but it, it can influence your results. Um, uh, my question is, do we need to visualize all of the context to see if it fits perfectly? If so, wait, do we, okay. Do we need to visualize all of the context to see if it fits perfectly? If so, how do we do that also? Is it different for long reads? Visualize all the context to see if it fits perfectly. Um, I'm not sure when this was asked. Um, so if this is for mags, um, I would visualize only in the cases where you really care, um, uh, like where you very specifically care about the quality. Um, like I said, going through that, uh, the manual curation process, it takes a lot of time. Um, so if you care about certain genomes, then yes, I would visualize. Um, and you can do that through Anvio, like I, uh, I mentioned during the talk. Um, Anvio, uh, it has a lot of documentation. Um, it's really well maintained. So I, I suggest that tool. Um, is So for long reads, um, the processing will be different uh, for sure. Um, there are some binning tools that are coming out that can leverage both simultaneously. Um, generally with long reads, what you have to do is error. Uh, generally they're more error prone. Um, so you also want to have associated short reads with those long reads. And so you use those uh, short reads to then correct errors that uh, happened on the long reads by aligning them um, and then using the consensus. And then from there, you can use uh, the, the same processes that I've described where you're mapping um, to those contigs and then you can still run it through these, um, these binners uh, just as you would normally. Um, what do you do when vertical coverage across a contig is non-uniform? Um, so this is possible um, and likely, um, but uh, so if it's across a single contig, um, so I guess there's there's a, a couple of scenarios here. So if if you are specifically looking at this contig um, for uh, let's say it's not within the context of a genome um, and you're, you just care about this one contact, um, I would um, maybe try to annotate uh, both sides of where that, um, that difference in vertical coverage happens um, and see if there's uh, some potential for a misassembly. Um, MetaQuast is a tool you can use um, that will also sort of help identify um, potentially uh, aberrant contigs and visualize some of that information. Um, if it's within a genome, um, then, so if it's like within a mag, for example, um, and that, that particular contig has an aberrant um, sort of abundance that is very different from the rest, then I would just remove that contig um, from your genome. Uh, again, I would use some of the sequence composition and the abundance information across many samples, though. 
Um, so it's, uh, again, use like Anvio for that uh, sort of situation. Um, um, what ORF tool is best for metagenomes with eukes, prots, and viruses? Um, so in general, um, prodigal is used for um, prokaryotes and viruses. Eukaryotes, I don't know if I have a uh, particular recommendation. Um, GeneMark uh, has some um, already trained um, ORF prediction tools designed for eukaryotes. So I'd maybe look there. Um, I, I also listed a couple tools that um, try to do eukaryotic gene prediction well. It's just a very tough problem. Um, and I don't, I don't know if there's one best solution right now. I'm also not as tapped into that literature. Um, so yeah, just that answer comes with a caveat. Um, what tool would you use to build a network from all to all searches of genes? So um, to do the alignment itself, uh, I would use um, Diamond. Uh, so Diamond Blast or um, MM62 can uh, basically run a quick blast search for you. That's fairly accurate. And then um, to build a network from the all versus all searches, um, MCL, um, Markov clustering uh, algorithm, um, is a tool that's typically used to build um, protein clusters um, and it performs fairly well. Um, so that, yeah, that's generally what I would use. Um, does one binner identify CPR genomes best? Um, so I, I, I haven't necessarily seen any data to support one binner identifying CPR genomes best. Um, however, when you run a quality estimate on your genomes. Um, CheckM does provide now a um, alternate search for um, CPR um, single copy genes. Uh, so, so just make sure when you're um, looking for the quality of your genomes that you specifically tailor that uh, to CPR if that's what you're interested in. Um, all right, um, I think that's it. Um, okay. Um, yeah, if anyone has any other questions, I'll be here for a little bit, but um, you can also email me, uh, which you'll be able to see in, that, in the presentation. Um, yeah, thanks for coming and have a nice day. have a column where you can identify um, like how much of the HMM um, it filled out. Uh, so like if it was partial or full. Um, so you, you should be able to um, filter that information from your results. But yeah, that, that is possible, yes. When you are using your own index or barcodes, do you have any recommendations? Um, I, I don't, I haven't specifically done that myself. Um, I know many labs do. Uh, if, so if the question is if you, so if you already have your, so I can answer it from the perspective of if you already have your in, your index and or barcodes um, and you know those sequences, um, you can provide that file to that like adapters um, FASTA file too, uh, to try to remove those out. Um, but in terms of like specifically deciding on what to use, um, I don't necessarily have a good answer for that. Um, they're even within the Sullivan lab, they, um, definitely do that. Um, so if, uh, if you're interested in that and you can't find that elsewhere, um, you can email me about that and I can uh, connect you with someone who might be able to answer that a little better. <laughs>
Um, should your first pass contigs and second pass contigs be combined? First, um, I'm not exactly sure what first pass and second pass means. Um, first pass and second pass. Um, if you're like reassembling a genome or um, doing subsampling. Um, so let's say you subsample a, um, a certain sample by like 50% and you assemble both of those 50% independently, I would um, then combine the two and dereplicate. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what that is asking though. Um, um, how is the completeness contamination of viral genomes determined? Um, so it's much more complicated uh, when it comes to viruses because we don't have those single copy genes to reference. Um, there's a recent tool developed called Check V, um, which aims at uh, uh, sort of approximating uh, this question uh, based on um, some known viruses that already exist. Um, there's not a, a great solution to this yet. Um, it's probably bound to happen fairly soon um, at some point here, but um, I don't think we have like a great estimate for viral genome completeness or contamination. And that's partly why I was suggesting not to use these binning approaches on vi viral genomes, because we don't have a good estimate for that. Um, so if you use the contigs, then you don't really have an issue in terms of contamination. It is possible you have a misassembly, but um, the the risk of having a contig in there that doesn't belong is zero because you're only using a singular contig for that genome. Um, first pass initial metagenome assembly, second pass taking reads that do not map and reassembling them. Um, uh, so so the point of doing that like first and second pass would be. Um, uh, if you, so it, it depends on what you do with this. So if your initial metagenome assembly also includes binning, um, I would not include those, uh, those contigs again in that second pass. Um, if you're just assembling first pass and then mapping reads to it, um, taking everything that didn't map, um, and then assembling that again, um, then yes, I would combine uh, after that step. Um, would vcontact2 be like a viral binner? No. Um, vcontact2 is a tool to um, uh, appro approximate the taxonomic affiliation of viruses. Um, it's not necessarily a, it is not a binner. Um, it's really just trying to um, identify the taxonomy. And it does that really well. Um, okay. Uh, all right, I think I've answered them all so far. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming and listening and asking questions. I appreciate it.